Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Millionaire Insurance Producer Podcast. My name is Charles Specht. I am your host, and what I do is help insurance agents build a $1 million or more book of business through signed broker of record letters. Guess what I want to talk about today. I'm going to talk about BOR 101. In other words, the broker of record letter process. This is really the key. This is the issue. The coveted BOR. You know, I um, I spend a fair amount of time on LinkedIn because I love just conversing back and forth with insurance agents there. And I, maybe about two, three months ago, I, I did a, a survey, one of those surveys, a poll on LinkedIn. And it had to do with whether or not you feel that the broker of record letter is ethical or unethical. Now, the survey wasn't even whether or not you use broker of record letters uh, as in a, a prospecting tool, if you will. It wasn't even whether or not you've ever gotten one. It wasn't whether or not somebody got one from you on one of your accounts. It was whether they think broker of record letters are ethical. Ethical. In other words, the, the, the answer is if you don't feel they're ethical, then you feel that insurance agents who go after broker of record letters are doing something unethical. That really was the key on the survey. And the, there was um, nearly one out of four, I believe, one out of four people mentioned that it was unethical. Strange. Strange. Um, I disagree with those people. I wholeheartedly disagree with those people. I understand maybe what they're thinking, but I wholeheartedly disagree with them because they have given an answer based upon not having the information. They have made a decision without actually gone, going through all of the data and the reasoning why. I actually feel that asking for a broker of record letter too soon can be certainly quasi unethical. It's almost like you know you're meeting someone from someone for the first time and you say, "Hey, will you please fire your agent and hire me without having built any rapport or uncovered any pains or anything like that?" That would be fairly questionable behavior. We'll just call it that questionable behavior. But going after the broker of record letter. There's a few things here that I'm going to be talking about in this episode, but I need for us to understand this main component to why the broker of record letter exists and what it really should be used for, rather than something really that the producer can use. The broker of record letter is something the insurance buyer, the insured, needs to have. It is the broker of record letter. It is the the last resort to ensure that the agent is going to give them proper service. It is the threat of leaving. It is the threat of removal. The broker of record letter has potency in that it causes the insurance agent to actually step up and provide the service that they should be, that they should be offering. If they do not, then with one signature on the right piece of paper can sever their relationship, and depending upon whether it's PNC or EB, it can stop them from collecting commission the very next month or certainly at renewal. The broker of record letter is the insured's, the insured's sword, it's the insured's weapon. It's the insured's arsenal to ensure that insurance agents actually do a good job. And therefore, an insurance agent who's a savvy insurance agent comes in and meet with, meets with a prospect, spends that time building the rapport, spends time uncovering the main pains that they're having with their insurance provider, then shows the proper solutions to those, those issues by showing them a 12-month timeline of service, then asks for the business if the insured wants to make that switch, they should be able to make that switch. Without this getting into a rant, let me just tell you, I do not at all like or agree with insurance carriers that have a problem with the broker of record letter. It exists for your policyholder. That's what it exists for. If an insurance agent out there is doing something wrong, unethical, morally irresponsible, or just flat out bad business, then go ahead and remove their appointment. But you don't get rid of something that is the insurance 
the insured's most important weapon to ensure that that appointed agent is going to give them the proper service. Really, that's the issue. In fact, you know, speaking to so many different insurance carriers, it's not that much of an issue to just change, you know, the agent code, if you will, from one agency to another agency on the policy. It's not that big of a dif difference. The issue is that whether or not the insurance agent is giving service and whether or not the insured understands that the current agent that they have is the right one or the wrong one. The broker of record letter is absolutely ethical. I believe that every single insurance carrier ought to have a broker of record letter or agent of record letter um, operation system, if you will, in which to process those appropriately. They should, have, um, they should have rights and wrongs, do's and don'ts in regards to what theirs is, but they should accept the broker of record letter even up to the very day of policy renewal. I also believe, frankly, that... It is unethical for an insurance carrier not to accept the broker of record letter. I feel that the insurance carrier themselves should have a slap on the wrist from the DOI if they choose not to accept the broker of record letter to then cause the insured to have to have a bad, a bad experience, a bad relationship, not doing the things that are in the best interest of the policyholder, which frankly, we as insurance agents, we have something that's called ethics. We have ethics training. One of the things we're supposed to do is make sure that we don't do any harm, if you will, to the insurance policyholder. To force an insured to remain with an insurance agent who does not provide any service or provide subpar service and have to stay with that insurance agent for the entirety of the year, which could cause them to suddenly have claims. There's no risk management. Nobody's helping them with their experience modification factor. Nobody's really on their team to force that insured to have to stay with that insurance agent, frankly, I think is unethical. I would love for the insurance industry to have a complete change in what the broker of record letter is and what it does. It is not only ethical, it is very, very good. And so I want to talk about it. The broker of record letter process. In other words, how can an insurance agent utilize or use the broker of record letter as a way in which to prospect, as the goal for prospecting, as the goal for why they even show up to prospect in the first place. I do believe that the broker of record letter, again, is not only ethical, I also feel it is in the insured's best interest to know that it exists, to know that it is something that they can use at any one time. And I also feel that it is in the insurance agent's best interest to have the broker of record letter as the trophy of what they're trying to accomplish. So let's kind of break this down for you here in just a moment. Um, when I, I started in the insurance business in the year 2000, I was an insurance producer for a couple of different agencies. I had a fair amount of success. I had a book of business over a million dollars of annualized commission. I was doing fine. I decided I wanted to get out of production because I wanted to go into ministry. I've always been a bivocational pastor for about the last 12 years, um, doing an insurance, being in the consulting business, you know, working with agents and agencies, as well as preaching the Word of God to those who need to hear. That's what I'm actually passionate about. And so I left the brokerage side of it so that I could focus more on that because, you know, here's really the issue. If you're a pastor of a church and somebody needs to speak to their pastor right away, you can't say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but Bob's plumbing, you know, his inland marine policy is coming up for renewal in this next, you know, couple of days, and I'm just swamped right now. I just can't meet with you. Well, that can't happen, obviously, if you're a pastor of the church. So I decided that if I was going to be going into ministry, um, even from a bivocational perspective, um, I needed to be able to have freedom in my schedule so that I could do what I want. So I made a willful decision to make a switch, left the brokerage side of selling insurance and made that switch. In fact, I uh, mentioned even on the last podcast, but Seth Godin's book, Tribes, page 35, helped me really understand what that meant. I, I switched from the brokerage side of selling insurance to a consulting to a consultant. What I am, even to this day, is that I am hired directly by the insurance buyer to give them unbiased advice 
and help them manage the insurance renewal process in a way that helps them and that gives them a much more favorable outcome. Okay, because again, they don't know what insurance agents do. They don't know how to choose an insurance agent. They don't know how to, you know, give markets or you know work with one. They just they don't know. And so I'm there to provide that unbiased advice. As I began working with insurance buyers, you know, you have to understand, I only came at it from the perspective of an insurance agent to begin with. I had never worked with insurance buyers up to that point on an independent basis, unbiased on their side of the table. When I was an, a producer for 10 years. Um, I never really thought about the broker of record letter as a tool in which to use, or that really is kind of like the trophy. I would tell you that it was something that was there towards the top of my mind, not really on the top of my mind. I won a lot of broker of record letters in my time, but it was probably a very low percentage of the times in which I actually went through a quoting process. It just wasn't really on the top of my mind as maybe something I need to really focus on. I want you to understand and listen to me. It wasn't until I began working with insurance buyers for a couple of years before I began to realize that, you know, for the most part, they didn't necessarily want to leave their agent unless they, you know, they hired me specifically to help them find that. It wasn't that they wanted to leave their agent. It was that they didn't know how to trust their agent or they, they because there was a lot of ambiguity in the whole relationship, um, they didn't have confidence that, you know, they were doing it right. What they wanted was to be able to trust you. The problem was they didn't know how to do that. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons why this is an issue. And frankly, the compensation structure of insurance agents out there prohibits, prohibits you and the insurance buyer from potentially having a relationship where you, know, you, can, you can have mutual trust back and forth. What I mean by that is, you know, at, from making commission on a policy, it is in your best interest not to lower it, if you will, and it's in the insured's best interest to lower it. So those are two competing ideologies, if you will, and so the commission structure is really never in the policyholder's best interest, okay, for the most part. And so because of that, there's just a lack of trust. I do believe it stems largely from the standpoint of the com compensation structure, but there's just a lack of trust, the other issue, frankly, is just their lack of understanding, a lack of comprehension about how it all works. Unfortunately, insurance agents keep their policyholders in the dark. They don't teach them. They don't educate them. They don't explain how it works. They don't explain which carriers they're going to and why and how they're going to stra strategically market their account out to the marketplace and what kind of a submission they're going to put together and how they're going to negotiate with the underwriters and then even renegotiate with the underwriters once quotes have been received. Again, most insurance agents do not explain that to the insurance buyer. Therefore, the insurance buyer is in the dark. They don't know how it works. They don't, therefore, then do not have confidence, and so they hire me so that I can give them unbiased advice. If all the insurance agents out there could do a much better job of providing confidence and transparency in the whole process, um, my consulting practice probably would go away on that side. Um, there just wouldn't really be a need for me. But the lack of transparency, the lack of education simply allows me then to have that consulting practice as an unbiased insurance consultant who represents no carriers, receives no commission, just gives them unbiased advice and manages the process. Here's the thing. As I started working with those insurance buyers for a couple of years, I began to realize that what they want is just to trust one agent and just if they could just trust that one agent you know, to go out and you know, get the quotes from the carriers and make sure that they were doing what they needed to do on the, on the actual um, per, um, submission, um, if they would definitely you know, work on their behalf to strategically negotiate and renegotiate with the underwriters, if the insurance policyholder, the insured, could then trust you to do that, they would rather do that. They'd rather trust one agent rather than getting multiple agents involved. And as I began to realize this, as I was just like talking to my clients and just kind of hearing what they want and, and what they would rather do and just the, the hassle of just going through the quoting process, I began to realize a number of different things. One, they hate the quoting process as much as you do. They hate it even more. What they would rather do is have a broker of record letter for the right agent who does the right thing. They want one agent who will do the right thing. That's what they want. They are proponents of the broker of record letter. 
Now, so the issue then is it's ethical. The insurance policyholder wants it. You as an insurance agent, a prospecting agent, want the insured to sign it. The incumbent agent wants them not to sign it, which then causes, forces the incumbent agent to provide good service. That's what it does. Forces you to provide good service. How then can a competing agent begin to position themselves so that they can get awarded the broker of record letter more often? That's what I want to uncover for you right now. I want to pull back the curtain, if you will. The Wizard of Oz here. I'm going to pull back the curtain on the land of BOR so that you can see it for yourself. You can see what it looks like. You can smell it. You can taste it. You can understand how it all works. And so here's just a few things on what you need to do in order to get more signed broker of record letters. How to position yourself. How to win them. How to build your book of business to a million dollars or more by utilizing the broker of record letter. First and foremost, quoting insurance policy renewals. This is number one. Quoting insurance policy renewals for your prospects is the enemy of the broker of record letter process. Quoting is for the weak. Quoting is for losers. Literally, not even figuratively, literally. Whoever's the incumbent agent wins 92% of the time. You as a competing agent, you've got an 8% shot at winning the business in a normal competitive quoting arrangement. So it's for losers. It is not a winner's approach to do quotes during a normal competitive renewal situation. The broker of record letter process then is the antithesis of that. It is the opposite. It is the enemy of quoting. And so if you're going to be willing to just offer quotes at any one time, then I would fully expect your strategy for winning the business by a signed broker of record letter is limping, limping, weak, not strong. So you have to understand that if you're going to be putting a line in the sand, talking to a prospect, and you are, you know, you're getting along with them, you built the rapport, you've uncovered the problems, you provided your solutions, solutions, you've showed them what you're going to be providing in the course of a year for services. If you put a line in the sand and say that in order for us to go, you know, further, I would want to represent your current carrier as well as all of these other carriers that we represent going forward. If you put that line in the sand, that's probably one of the more difficult things for you to do as an insurance producer. And yet, it is probably the wisest thing you could ever do as an insurance producer. So you have to understand that quoting is for the weak. Quoting wastes your time. Quoting wastes the insured's time. Quoting wastes the underwriter's time. Nobody really wins in the long run in regards to quoting. They just don't win, particularly insurance agents who are quoting. So... The first part is just really that mindset, understanding that quoting is the opposite of the broker of record letter process. The second real part, if you will, just comes down then to a little bit more of that mindset issue that we have to know then what's the trophy. Because if we're not going to offer blind quotes in a process with people who haven't trusted us yet, if we're not going to do that, what are we going to do? Well, what you can need to do is you need to actually define what is the goal of our prospecting. Most insurance agents have um, a goal of just trying to set appointments, okay? That might even be like their main goal or certainly their first goal when it comes to prospecting. They send out emails, they do cold calls and so forth with the expectation that they just want to set an appointment or two, okay? So that might be the beginning of it, but then really what is the goal when you meet with your prospect? What is the goal when you get them on the telephone? What's the goal when you're talking to the business owner on the first cold call? What's the goal of the email? Well, I would tell you that the goal doesn't necessarily need to be just a meeting. The goal, the, the actual goal of what we're trying to accomplish is their signature on your broker of record letter at the end of the meeting. That has to be the goal. That has to be the trophy. That's the reason that you're meeting with them. There's a reason they're meeting with you. What's the reason you're meeting with them? If your goal is simply just to go through the quoting process, you don't have to meet with them. If your goal is just to throw mud against the wall to see what sticks, you don't have to have a broker of record letter process. But I'm telling you that you need to go into the entire process of 
of prospecting and going after new business with the idea that the trophy here is not quoting. The trophy is to get somebody else fired and you hired. The trophy is the insurance policyholder's signature on your broker of record letter. That is the trophy. And again, that's a mindset. Not offering quotes any longer, mindset. Going after a signature on a piece of paper, that's a mindset issue. So a lot of this process is a, a process of switching your thinking. You need to rethink your strategy for prospecting new business. That's what we have to do. We have to rethink our strategy for prospecting new business. That's, well, that's something I can't actually do for you. I literally can't do that for you. Today I was talking, um, um, pretty soon in the next few weeks, um, I will, it'll go live. I was doing a podcast interview with Rick Fox as, and some others over on the Vertifor podcast. Definitely listen to that podcast. It's awesome, wonderful. One of the things that just came up in the conversation, you know, as I was talking with Rick is like, you know, I have a lot of insurance agents, for example, over the course of a number of years now working with them, and many of them will hire me. They'll pay whatever the fee is to, to have coaching and training, but really what they want is they want magic fairy dust. That's what they want. They want me to sprinkle them with some magic fairy dust and to make everything good. And so many times, like if I feel that an insurance agent is just looking for magic fairy dust, I have to have kind of a, you know, just a heart-to-heart, -heart blunt conversation that I don't have that. Um, we're definitely going to talk about you know, scripting. We're going to be talking about tactics. We're going to be talking about strategy and so forth. But at the end of the day, if you don't actually do the work, there's no hope for you. Literally, if you're not actually going to make the phone calls, I can't help you. You could be the best cold caller the world has ever seen. You could cold call so good that you make the incumbent agent blush. You could cold call so good that it makes the insurance buyer almost want to buy right through the phone line. But if you don't actually pick up the telephone and dial seven specific numbers, there's not a single thing I can do for you, period. There's no magic fairy dust here. You have to do the work. So the same thing comes down to it. I can't change your thinking. I can't change your mindset. You can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. Somebody did say, but you can make their oats salty, and that's what I'm trying to do here with the broker of record letter process. I'm just saying, look at those yummy, salty oats. Man, that's good. And then when you, when you eat it, and you realize how good it is, you want that thirst, or you've got that thirst, you want that water, the water is the signature on a broker of record letter. Go get your water. Go get your water. Absolutely. So a large part of this is just the beginning part is mindset, but it's huge. We're not going to offer quotes. We're going to have a mindset shift that we're trying to get broker of record letters. Now, the third thing, if you, if you will, is... Insurance agents need to be micro-niched. Go back and listen to my podcast episode in regards to being micro-niched. Being micro-niched is the opposite of being a generalist. Okay, Being micro-niched is the opposite of being a generalist. Generalists can write a lot of business if they're getting lots of referrals. I know of a, a number of insurance agents who have large books of business because they get so much referrals. You know what? You're going to have a generalist book of business. You're going to have lots of different industries when you do that. But man, that's good business to get because it's usually going to be a broker of record letter um, play when you are getting referred into something. So it's different. But for those who aren't getting all of these referrals, if you will, they're not getting brought into all of these things, you need to have a smarter approach. Micro-niching. Micro-niching means that you're going to be focused in one particular industry, if you will. You're going to be focused on one particular product, such as workers' compensation. You're going to be focused, but, but usually in an industry um, such as... Oh, I'm just kind of looking around my office. Could it be... Ah, we've got uh, leather furniture stores. Maybe leather furniture stores could be your thing. And so when you then are micro-niched, you're going to tend to put together brochures and marketing and emails and branding on LinkedIn and your, your time on the services, which we're going to talk about. All of that is going to be geared towards leather furniture manufacturing. 
they're always going to see you as being in that. You're going to go to the leather furniture manufacturing associations. You're going to go to the networking events. When somebody asks you, what do you do? Oh, I'm in the leather furniture uh, manufacturing industry. I just happen to have a specialization in insurance and financial services for the leather furniture uh, manufacturing industry. That's a completely different mindset than just saying, well, I'm an insurance agent and I offer quotes. Uh, what, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm an insurance agent and I offer quotes. Versus, oh, I'm in the um, leather furniture manufacturing industry and I have a specialization in insurance and risk management. Completely different mindset. And frankly, the big issue is here is that how does the insured perceive you? That's this next point. How does the insured perceive you? You need to be micro-niched. When the insured perceives you as being in their industry, you're going to get them more often to do what you want them to do. They're going to sign your broker record letter more often than not. Very important. So being micro-niched, it's key. It's critical. Those who, um, frankly, are micro-niched, they write more clients, they have a bigger book of business, they get more broker record letters. I was just talking with another insurance um, agent yesterday. Uh, we were just kind of, you know, just talking about a particular agency that we're both familiar with. We started talking about this one agent. Um, she is awesome. She is a power broker. She's got a $12 million book of business. $12 million book of business. And I'm not talking premium, uh, which is always what, like, the direct writers last week. Farmers agents say, are you talking premium or revenue? Well, when you're talking about book of business, I'm always talking commission. We don't talk premium because you can't spend it. You try to spend it, you're going to end up in jail. An insurance agency is concerned about revenue, commission. $12 million worth of commission, one agent, that's a large book of business. Um, mindset. Micro-niched. She does one thing, and she does it well. She does it so good, frankly, that other agents in the agency where she works at, a larger agency, they all bring her in on, on particular accounts with that specific policy so that she could write it. In fact, it's interesting. I think, you know, I, I don't know this for sure, but I would say that a very large percentage of her overall $12 million book of business is because other agents have brought her in specifically for her micro-niche expertise. Wow. Could you do that? Could you do that? I know you can. Another part of the broker record letter process is now that you're micro-niched, you need to have, you need to have a, a very clear, objective, strategic, written timeline of services that you show to your prospect. The timeline of services needs to be 12 months long. It represents all the things you're going to do for the insured. It should have specific dates. Unfortunately, most agents do a terrible job at putting together a timeline of services. They just, they kind of make it very broad. Oh, you know, maybe sometime between January and March we'll do this. And, oh, we're just going to provide these bullet point things. But they don't really list them out when these are going to take place. The more specific, the better. It should be branded, if you will, back for the leather furniture manufacturers. It should then show what you're going to do on January 6th and what you're going to do on January 17th and what you're going to do on February you know, um, 9th. And you just kind of you go down the list so that they can actually see what it's going to be like to be serviced by you, what it's going to be like to be with your agency. They don't know. If you don't have any kind of an objective, written, strategic time on a services, then it's all just verbal exercise. You're trying to talk them into it. You're trying to you know, beat around the bush, if you will, just kind of start talking, and, and hopefully they'll, real, they'll, they'll begin thinking, oh, I bet you I could probably get really good service from this person because they seem nice. No. The time on a services is written so that they can actually see it. It is branded based upon their micro niche. It then itemizes, not just a whole bunch of stuff you're going to do, less is more so long as it is the right information. It's going to highlight the basic things that you know are a problem, not only for their industry, but for them as an individual business owner, right? So if it's an industry you know, thing, um, I mean, I'm, just off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure what the issue would be for leather, uh, furniture manufacturers, but maybe you could be talking about, you know, just how you are um, helping them purchase leather for less money, how you are finding other employees out there who understand furniture, um, those who are also maybe in the leather industry. So how maybe you, maybe one of the services you provide is helping them in regards to recruiting by both um, leather as well as furniture and bring them in in the manufacturing side. Um, there's lots of different things you could do. Many, most of them, however, are going to be insurance-related. The ones that will set you apart from all the rest of the competition, however, are industry-related. That timeline of services will 
unquestionably, without question, let me say it again, that timeline of services, without question, will get you more signed broker of record letters than almost anything you could do. It is your strongest weapon. Man, it is strange that insurance agents have no timeline of services. It is weird that they just show up and wing it. It is weird. You want to know why I know it's weird? Because when I think back to when I was an insurance agent, I didn't have a timeline of services. Man, that's weird. I didn't have a timeline of services. Oh, I had a brochure. The thing probably cost like five bucks a pop. I had a brochure. I had some other things that I showed them. It was long. Sometimes it was like 14, 15 pages long. Um, it was good information. It wasn't a timeline of services. It was, look at us. Look how big we are. Look what we can do. We can do all this. We Look at these people that we insure. All this over here. We can do that. We can do this. We can do that. But it really didn't provide any actual documentation that the insured could see and understand. Man, I missed out. The timeline of services, yeah, many agents have these types of things, but they're just not really set up for the insured. What the insured is trying to do when they meet with you and they're looking you across their desk, they're thinking to themselves, do I want to waste my time with this person? Do I even want to have this person quote? Do I even have any trust for this person? They're trying to figure that out. The timeline of services is going to answer all those questions. The timeline of services, when done right, is going to make the insured very confident, very comfortable with you. They're going to realize that you have the right solutions to all the problems that they deal with. So that at the end, of even your first meeting, and I believe that about 15% of the insurance buyers out there aren't happy with their agent, they'd sign that broker of record letter first meeting if you asked for it, which is another issue. Hashtag ask for the sale. You better just start asking for the things that you want. They will sign it. At the end of the meeting, when you uncover the pains that they have and you present your time on the services and it is branded for them in their industry, they're much more likely to sign it. You are much more likely to win right there during that first appointment. You get the signature on your broker of record letter. You just won a new client. You just were victorious. That's the trophy. You won. Now, there's a lot of other little things. A lot of other little things you know, that I teach agents to do and so forth inside that process, but those are the main ones. If you're interested in knowing more about the things that can be done, I encourage you to go to brokerofrecordletter.com and learn more about it in regards to the, the mastermind, brokerofrecordletter.com. But for the most part, the main issues are you got to have that mindset shift and that we're just not going to quote anymore. We're going to have a mindset shift and that the trophy is now going to be for the broker of record letter. We're now going to be micro niche. We're not going to be a generalist. We're going to be focused on one thing. That is really it's so, such critical for insurance agents. And then that fourth thing is the timeline of services. We are going to get very strategic in this process. We're going to know what we want and how we're going to accomplish it and what is the definition of winning. Winning. Hmm. I wonder how many broker of record letters you could get just in the next 30 days if you just started meeting with a whole bunch of people, going through this process, putting a line in the sand, saying, if you want to do business with me and my agency, and these are the services that you would want, I'll make it happen with one signature on a piece of paper. Imagine how that could change your business. Hmm. Just imagine. Before I end, I want to encourage you. There's no reason why you can't be successful. There is no reason why you can't build a $1 million or more book of business. There's no reason you, why you can't have two or $4 million. Come up with, that, what, come up with that, that size of book that you want, and then you have to put together the process, the plan, the strategy, make it happen. But there's no reason why you can't be successful. There's no reason why. Right now, you can't get more clients than you could imagine. There's no reason why today you could pick up the phone and start doing cold calling and set seven appointments. There's no reason why out of those seven appointments that you couldn't get three, maybe four broke 
book of record letters from those appointments. You just do this on a consistent basis, week after week, month after month. Imagine how many clients you would get and you would never even have to offer a quote to anyone who wasn't a client yet. Imagine how much time you will save both yourself, your team, and your underwriters by never having a quote for a non-client. You Once you get the signed broker of record letter and they are your client, you do everything for them. You go to all the markets and you get everything on their behalf. But until that moment, you don't waste time. Go to brokerofrecordletter.com. I encourage you to get involved. All of that process is there. It's right there for you. Even in my digital course, Millionaire Producer School, I have about 120 different training videos that teach you all the different steps that you need to do. There's even information in there about how to set up your LinkedIn profile, the messaging that you can use to actually prospect. All of that is there. Examples of timeline of services, it's there. There's no reason why you can't have access to it effective today. Brokerofrecordletter.com. Might be the best thing you ever do for yourself. My name is Charles Specht. I am the president and CEO of Permission Network Insurance Agency, where I teach and train insurance agents how to build a $1 million or more book of business through signed broker of record letters. This is the Millionaire Insurance Producer Podcast.